Hello, I'm Jonathan Bowman Perks, and welcome back to my favorite time of the week. And as part of the Inspiring Leadership series, I am greatly honored to have General Sir Rupert Smith, KCB, DSO and Bar, OBE, QGM. And General Sir Rupert was um, a real strategic thinker for the Army, changed the way things were, quite a quantum change when he and others that he influenced began to shape the way that uh, the Army thought and approached uh, leadership, command and strategy, which is why it's so great to have him on, the, uh, on this series. He's the author of The Utility of Force. Um, he was a parachute regiment officer who commanded the 1st UK Armoured Division in the Gulf War with great aplomb. Uh, he also commanded UN forces in the Bosnian War, and he was General Officer Commanding Headquarters Northern Ireland, as well as becoming the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe. So a great career. General, it's lovely to have you on the series and tell us about what's going on for you right now in COVID-19. Uh, well, I'm, um, I've been locked down in Brussels, uh, where I was when uh, it all started. And um, I've been here ever since. I, I hope to get to England next week. <laughs> 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 yeah. And, and what about the, um, we were talking, we had a good uh, chat before we started this uh, recording um, about so many CEOs and leaders and politicians, not in the UK, but everywhere you look, are struggling with uh, this unexpected crisis that's going on. They don't know the length of it. So they're reacting in random ways, panic. Some, some are handling it well. Some think it's all going to be over by Christmas and this kind of stuff. You've dealt with many different real-time crises and wars and situations. What's been your view from the strategic perspective and also your tips on how people handle the unexpected? Oh, um, <laughs> let's see what I can do. Uh, I would like to start by um, defining the word crisis. We, we spend, it's used in ordinary conversation as, mm. as a description of bad day or I'm having a crisis, I missed the train, or something like that. I, I don't think that's actually a very helpful uh, a way of understanding what's facing us at the moment. Yeah. And uh, for my part, a, a crisis is, uh, an, an incidentally, a battle mm -hmm. or a fight is a crisis. Yeah. Um, it's an unstable or crucial time or state of affairs in which a decisive change is impending, especially uh, one with dis which is puts you at a disadvantage or uh, it, uh, there's an undesirable outcome. Hmm. Um, the turning point or decision point is extremely easy to see after the event and yeah. it's very, very difficult to find in the event. Um, the second thing I make about a crisis, uh, and if you want to, I can go into this in much more time, but um, you're not looking for the right answer. If there was a right answer, then you wouldn't be having a crisis. Mm. You'd catch another train or whatever. The, it, so that what happens in a crisis is that everybody is more or less wrong. Yeah. What you're trying to be is the least wrong. <laughs> or the most right. Yeah. Um, and, um, and don't get, uh, and I find it helpful to say something to myself, like do the best you can until the best you can do is no longer right. And then you can stop pursuing, um, um, you know, things that aren't working properly in a dogged fashion. Yeah. Um, if, if you like, it's a definition of pragmatism. Yeah. Um, lastly, I think in a crisis, you need uh, to be very clear, uh, because you can't reverse out of a crisis, because you can't return to the status quo ante, you need strategically to establish what you want, where you want to be, how you want to be, what is your outcome at the end? Um, now, people say these are aims and so forth. Uh, I don't want to dress it up in too big a word because it's very difficult to be precise. 
but you at least should know what it will look like. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, and to take the COVID crisis, I have great difficulty in anyone seeing anyone setting such uh, an objective. Mm. Secondly, you need therefore to establish the direction you are going to travel, which isn't necessarily geographical, mm. um, from where you are to where you want to be when it's all over. Mm. And that will tell you, the, the steps down that direction will tell you what your immediate objectives are and mm. in what order you need to address them. Yeah. The second thing you must have is information. If you don't collect the information, you won't know what's happening. Mm. You won't know what's right or wrong. You won't know what's best to do next. And you will always be uh, surprised. Mm. And the last thing is timing. Um, it depends on the nature of the crisis. Uh, but if you can move faster than the crisis, then you will get ahead of the game and be dictating events. Even in the one we've got at the moment, which is a, a, a crisis of the whole of our context of our lives have changed. And a new factor has appeared in our lives. And this means that many of the assumptions on which our lives are based are no longer safe. Mm. And, and that, that's really what makes this a crisis strategically. It, mm. Of course, it's a different thing if you've got COVID and someone's trying to collect you to a, a, an oxygen machine. Mm. Um, but that's, that's a, not a strategic crisis. That's very personal. Yeah, like you had, because you unfortunately have, have suffered yes, from COVID-19. Yeah. How long did it yeah. hit you for? Um, about two weeks. But it wasn't, um, I never got near an oxygen machine. It, it was just a rather unpleasant two weeks, a, a great deal worse than having flu. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and, and going with this um, COVID-19 and the fact that the world will be very different, do you, do you think people get that? Do they understand just the scale of how things will be so different, how long this will take, and that this is going to be part of our lives always, and therefore the economic recession or depression, almost of 1929 scales, will be with us for a long time, and, and how people must think differently? Because one of the things you've been so good at at all levels was just thinking differently and challenging with an unorthodox approach. How do you think people should be thinking? Um, again, I, I haven't got enough information um, to be remotely precise about this, but I'm, I think the, uh, if you do what I suggested about understanding where you want to go, uh, then lots of people, um, as it were, uh, within that strategic group that you as a strategist are trying to direct, they can then start to see the, what they've got to do or what it, how this is going to affect them. Mm. Um, at, at the moment, and understandably, we are at the stage when uh, people are trying to uh, 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 you know, defeat, if you like, the, the or, or delay the disease. Hmm. Um, now, uh, longer it goes on without a cure or a vaccine, uh, then the more we're going to have these surges of, of, um, of uh, infections and so on. Hmm. Um, uh, and we don't know whether we're over the worst. Hmm. Um, so there's that degree of uncertainty is going to be with us for some time. Hmm. And only by showing people the direction where they've, they're going can you start to handle uncertainty. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that brings on to another point. One of the things that made um, war fighting, planning, um, dealing with any crisis that people face much clearer was when they started to talk about commander's intent in military terms, but in in CEO's term of a business, intent, what my intent is. Um, 
that was quite new. And, and many in business don't get that. They don't give a clear burning why we're doing what we're doing, why our organization exists, where we are now, where we want to get to. How, how would you explain to people who are not military about commander's intent and, and how important it is, particularly when there's so much uncertainty around and lack of information? Um, well, the end, uh, for my, I used to uh, always write out my own um, as a test that I was thinking clearly. Um, um, occasionally people had to correct the spelling, but it was my writing. The, um, uh, it's more than just stating the outcome. It's stating succinctly how you're going to get there, the manner of getting there, the method of getting there. Um, it, now, I, I sympathize with someone running a business. Um, it, it's extremely difficult to see how you write such a thing. I, and I'm not actually sure that translating a, a military idea uh, where you are faced with a, an adversary um, and it's a binary outcome, win or lose, um, it is representative of business and commerce, mm. where the relationship is one of competition. Uh, and uh, you can come second and still make a profit. Uh, there in... in it's like a, I draw the distinction, uh, uh, my trade was like boxing. I, I won or lost. Mm. The majority of business is in a situation like a running race, where the objective isn't the other competitor, the objective is the tape at the end. Mm. The, the, and, and you share the rules, <laughs> otherwise you can't have the race. And, you, uh, and you're in competition with the other people. That produces completely different relationships. Mm. Uh, and uh, so I'm not, I'm, I, I'm sympathetic. Uh, I, I think the idea is there, it is translatable, but not the form. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. And, and we were chatting earlier about um, leadership versus command and what it means to be at the strategic level. I found that quite useful. And also you were talking about that key point at about, about hundred people when things change. Do you want to just talk a little bit about, about strategic level leadership versus command? I, I thought that was very helpful. I draw a distinction between leadership and command. Um, leaders are, are followed uh, and we can go and find books, books and books of lists of qualities and so forth. And I'm never sure they've helped anybody in the end. What I prefer to examine it from the other end. Uh, wh why was it that that man was followed? Mm. Um, and there is, to keep this mini lecture short, <laughs> the... the um, a leader is followed because those he leads trust that he knows where he's going and will recognize when he's got there. Uh, they trust that he knows the way there and they trust he will look after them on the way. Now, uh, he, they don't have to, I mean, they may also know what the objective looks like and all the rest of it. But essentially, they're following that person because he knows the aim, he knows the way, he, and he'll look after them. Mm. A commander um, is, uh, uh, has the same sort of three th things to satisfy, but in a different way. Those he commands have to know where they're going. That's why we write intention. Uh, those we command have to have the confidence and the trust in themselves that they know where they're going. Uh, they have to have the same 
trust in themselves and knowledge of the way they're going to get there. And still, they trust that commander will look after them on the way. Mm. And so your role as a commander in, is having to create a situation where those you are commanding have that degree of self-trust that they can do it. And mm. that's the difference between the two um, uh, leadership and command. And I think the break point, very, very roughly, is around 100 people. Um, and my reason for that is that you can stand up amongst 100 people, they can all see you, you can talk to them, you can remember all their names, um, and so forth. So you can have that uh, relationship where they trust you. The moment you're a commander, you have to work a different trick altogether, which is to get those uh, people to have the faith in themselves and to trust their, their faith. You, you, the commander, has to trust them. That's, that's really great. And, and we were also talking about how do you bring on talent, good people who will be good leaders. And sometimes it's chance, we were talking about luck and things like this, but as a parachute regiment officer, you created a permanent cadre in 1958 and you deliberately chose rather than get people from sixth form to, to have almost 50% of your officers came from the red brick universities. And you also mentioned that you were shaped by the fact that you had wartime commanders as parachute regiment commanding officers and you learned from them and they had a certain attitude and that's passed on. And in turn, we've now got, I think you said at one stage you had nine parachute regiment generals who all needed aide de camps, which were, they were running out of aide de camps to, to work with them. It would be interesting now to, to talk about that and, and bringing on talent and, thinking differently. Could you perhaps talk about that? We can then begin to go into some of your career and different, different right. stages and what you learned from those uh, as a leader and a commander. Um, I, to go back to your, your earlier statement, uh, we started having a permanent cadre of officers in 58. We didn't really reach that stage for about 10 years. Um, and during that time, we were very short of officers. Um, I say that because one of the things that uh, uh, was part of my life at that time was that uh, we were given responsibilities that would normally be held by much more senior officers than uh, we, we had. Um, and yes, uh, our commanders um, uh, had in many cases been in the uh, Second World War as young officers um, or in Korea or in both. Um, and uh, they had a, a view of your role as an officer, which was, um, to oversimplify it perhaps, that you were there to think. Uh, and I remember being told once that it's going to be a bloody shambles. Your job is to get everyone out the other side. Um, and they had that sort of attitude, were very happy for you to think um, and try things out um, and so on and so forth. They, they, I never felt restricted. Um, so you asked about selection. Mm. Um, I, I used to look uh, for uh, uh, various e evidence of various things in people I was going to select for um, promotion. Uh, one was that they were crisis proof, mm -hmm. um, that under pressure they went on thinking, they could think originally, um, they didn't infect other people with their doubts and 
concerns and so forth. Um, another was that they were um, practical men. Um, uh, 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 and, and, you know, they could dream all the dreams they liked, but they had to be realizable. Um, and they had to have the capacity to put those things, you know, realize their ideas. Um, then there were, uh, it's a mixture, common sense and intelligence. Uh, uh, and then um, they had to be brave, um, physically and morally. And, you know, at one level, you're looking at a group of junior NCOs and you can, you look for those qualities in their circumstances. If I'm up in a much higher level looking to see who I'd recommend to be a, a brigade commander, for example, mm. I'd still be thinking through those uh, uh, roughly four things, but what was the, uh, it, it would be, have to be within the setting of commanding um, 7,000 people and, mm. uh, 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 and, and the jobs you have to do. Um, and uh, a lot of people don't rise up the ranks like that. They reach points where they 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 don't go further. Yeah, and it, and it does interest me um, having met leaders both in business and uh, army officers. The the finest combination I find is a lovely mix of courage, humility, and discipline. Um, some we find have courage, but no humility at all. And they tell you how wonderful they are in Trumpesque style. Others have great humility and, and put others before them, but are very inspiring quietly. Um, sometimes parachute regiment officers were, were known for some of them being very cocky and telling you how great they were in the reg. Other times I know some fabulously humble and modest, uh, officers. So, so how do you get the right mix? Uh, to some extent, by example, mm. um, and uh, as I've wrote to you, uh, we always remember that. Pop I'm sorry, that fame has no present and popularity no future. Mm. Um, it's it's even if when you, I used when I'm drafting used to draft reports about people and when i was reading other people's reports i would often write that those lines across the top of the page and mm. test what's being said mm. Mm. Um. <laughs> very interesting and we talked earlier i was very interested in some of your proudest moments of your careers and some of the toughest moments and you told a, a story of um which i found very moving of when um, in Northern Ireland. Do you want to just share that story? Um, this was in answer to your question as to my proudest moment. Um, it's not, you know, I had difficulty thinking of it, uh, uh, but what came to mind uh, was this particular incident because I was um, uh, blown up in, in uh, uh, Ireland and what was um, made me proud was the number of soldiers who subsequently um, uh, came up to tell me um, uh, that they, they, hearing me on the radio, they had no idea uh, that I was as wounded as I was. Um, that is remarkable and you were 35 at the time you had 30 percent burns and your hands had to be rebuilt where what was this a, an incident that was in the news a lot or was it just an incident involving just you then it, it didn't know really there, there were there was another man injured as well yeah yeah that's that's remarkable and and then let's talk about other stages in your life and your career because it's 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 from these experiences you've become the person you are and the others, because you, you've had a huge influence on so many others of us, myself included, who've read um, things you've written and taken advice and wisdom from your different approach to life. But wh where did you begin as a young man, you know, parents, 
teachers, anybody influenced you in those early stages? Uh, well, about that. Uh, uh, of course, one's influenced by them all. Mm. Um, the, uh, my father was a, a Royal Air Force officer um, who um, uh, had fought through the war and stayed in the Air Force, um, according to him, to, so he could educate me. Um, and um, uh, it, it, so he was undoubtedly an influence, uh, as indeed my mother was. Mm. Um, I, they went on serving in the Air Force, so I went to boarding school fairly soon um, and stayed there and left it uh, as quickly as I possibly could um, and joined the army. Mm. Um, I'm not sure that, I mean, of course, uh, uh, school and all the rest of it has effects on you. Mm. Um, I, I don't know that it uh, gave me anything that, um, that other than the normal that, mm. you know, carried me into the future. Yeah. But um, what, were your, what were your parents' values that they lived by that perhaps looking back now, you have the same values? I, I have I, I have difficulty in remembering and the, the tr I have difficulty answering those questions because I just don't trust memory mm. at all. Mm. Um, if for nothing else, you now know the outcomes. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, mm. So I really don't know. Yeah. And what I do know is that uh, I joined the army. Um, Straight into the parachute regiment, or did you go no, somewhere else no, first? No, no, I was in a, a private soldier in the Duke of the Numbers regiment. Really? Um, right. And um, then I be went to Sandhurst uh, um, after the RCB and all, all of those things. And, um, and just, just staying with that for a moment, your time in the Duke of Edinburgh's regiment as a private soldier, was that just a few months or did you do a year? And, and, and did um, you learn a lot about how the soldier thinks and what life's like? that served you well later on? Um, a little, but it wasn't, I mean, recruit training and school are almost identical. Um, and if you've been at a boarding school from about seven, you, uh, there, there was nothing I needed to learn about running these places. Um, you know, for, for masters, read corporals and carry on. Mm. Um, the, uh, uh, and I lived when at home on RAF stations. I'd seen a lot of, and, and knew quite a lot of airmen and so forth as, mm. as a result. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, of course, it's a help. Mm. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, uh, and it certainly um, was a, an advantage in some ways when I got to Sandhurst because right. I had some idea what the hell everyone was shouting about. Yeah. And, and what about those early tours and uh, things you did before you then became a, a chief instructor at uh, Sandhurst? Uh, well, I had almost 11 years of regimental duty. Um, uh, and uh, it commanded a company um, uh, before I went to Staff College. Mm -hmm. um, as a acting major, um, we served in a number of countries, mm. and um, I learnt my trade. I suppose is mm. the way of understanding it. Mm. Uh, and somewhere around twenty six, twenty seven, I start to pay attention. Uh, it had been a, you know. I'm a child of the 60s. It, it had been a cracking good time. Um, but I, you know, every time we came back, I had enough money to buy a car and the skirts and moved another two inches up the legs. And it was a fantastic time. Yeah. I'd go back and do it all again. <laughs> uh, but at somewhere around 26, 27, I realized if I wanted to make this my profession, I needed to start to do some joined up handwriting and read a book or two so mm. that's what i did and, and was there anybody at that time 
who influenced you. You thought, oh, I, want, I respect him. I mean, you talked about these wartime commanders who you had as, as bosses, but anybody in particular that you look back and think? Well, I mean, the, the one that was possibly the most prominent was, there were two of them, uh, was a brigade commander called Rowley Gibbs, mm. and who'd commanded the battalion I was in, and then Farrah Hockley. Okay. Um, but, but in many ways, the ones that we used to do these tactical exercises with our troops, um, which you may have had to suffer from. But, mm -hmm. uh, and the practice at that time was to get some of the wartime um, leaders down to have lunch and talk to us on the side of some hill that we were doing this exercise on um, about what it was really like. Mm. And then you met some, you know, COs and brigade commanders from the war. And that, that was, uh, and I remained in correspondence with one of those um, up to and beyond the Gulf War wow. in 92, I think it was, mm. he died. Yeah. But it, um, uh, uh, and I know it's a fashionable word now, mentoring and so mm. forth. Mm. Um, if I, uh, we never had that relationship, but the yeah. nearest thing I had, you know, he, he, for example, wanted to read what I, my directives that I'd written in 1990. Uh, mm. And I, I remember when I was ADC to Peter Inge, um, we would travel in the car and go and see uh, General, General Marshal Bagnall. Yes. Ginge, as he was called, yeah. Um, yeah. Of, of which he was like seen like you as some of the people who thought differently. Uh, even when he was chief of the general staff, he was going to see him run ideas past him. Yeah. Um, and that seemed to work really, really well. Yeah. I, yeah. I think having, and now I'm finding in business that people, yes, they have mentors, but they also have reverse mentoring where they get younger generation, generation Z. And I saw Paul Nansen, the um, commandant of Santos, mm. who's just finished. He took, gave it a good talk today on generation Z and how to lead them because they're all, they're completely digitally connected generation and they need to be led in a different way or they have mm. some aspirations, mm. which I find very interesting. But you have been involved in training and developing others and helping to think differently, not only when you were chief instructor in 79 at Sandhurst, but also you at the adjunct at the depot and helping people to think differently. And then you also went out to Zimbabwe when you were trying to get the, the armies together from all the guerrilla forces as a lieutenant colonel. Do you want to just say a bit about any of those periods and and what you learned about leadership and the opportunities you had to expand your thinking? Um, the, uh, probably the most interesting was, would be the Zimbabwe uh, one. What, once the peace treaty at Lancaster House had been signed um, and the monitoring force had seen it into execution, there'd been an election, uh, that was the end of it. Uh, from the point of view of uh, London, with one exception. What they'd left behind was three armies uh, in one space. The former Rhodesian army, which was about 88% um, African, um, who owned, if you like, the infrastructure and nervous system of an army and an air force. Um, and then two guerrilla armies, each of which were tribally based, and had been allies uh, on the, in the patriotic front during the war. Um, uh, all armed, all likely to go to war with each other um, because the intertribal tensions were beginning to flare up. Now politics were taking place. Um, and I was told to take a team um, with a sum of money and was told to see what I could do uh, on behalf of Mr. Mugabe to amalgamate or deal with the three uh, uh, armies. And my, and here's an example of an, in, of an intent. Um, my objective 
was to form an inert self-administering mass and to do this through providing the training of administration and of organization mm. and we we called it the sausage machine and we ran it for about 18 months so that all the guerrillas were absorbed into a new army um, on the nervous system of the former army and then then you could you got all the weapons off them and then you could start to uh, discharge people and so forth mm. Wow. And, and then um, Deputy Commandant at Staff College um, with the High Commander Staff Course pilot they were doing back in 88. Um, and, and I found it very interesting you were talking when you were there about how when you've got a whole generation together at a staff college or where they're all learning together, they're all the same, same roughly the same age, different experiences, but um, they're all together. How you weren't interested in the reports were written, but you, well, you've looked at those later on, but you were particularly interested in going into group syndicate discussions and watching who they deferred to. Can you just say a bit more on that? I found that really interesting. Well, um, this, this cohort of, of people, the, the, that year's course, was going to move as a block through the surface. Um, they were, they'd all been selected, uh, in my time, it was about 15% of the uh, of the officers went to staff college, so it's quite a relatively small group. And uh, they'd all been around for 10, 15 years uh, uh, and were experienced men. Um, and I found the a good way of trying to pick the swans away out from the geese as they all swam around in this pond was to go round the syndicates and uh, just sit at the back and watch who was being deferred to by the other students. And they were telling me that they wanted to know what that man uh, thought. Um, and then, and we changed the syndicates, I think five times during the year. And so the next time they, someone produced me the lists of um, the, the next lists of syndicates, I would get out my notebook and make sure that a, that that potential swan I'd spotted was in a completely different group. And so slowly I could start, by, by the end of the year, I had a pretty clear ranking of who I thought were, were the people that were being, you know, that they'd, that course had actually selected as the, mm. the one they would follow. Yeah. And, yeah. and these, and as I say, this, uh, these guys may go and be employed by me and so forth, but from the point of view of the army, uh, they, they were the future mm. uh, and they would be commanding each other, not, yeah. not me. Yeah. And talking about commanding each other, you, you then uh, later on went on to be the general officer commanding the 1st UK Armoured Division as a parachute officer. A few noses put out a joint in the armoured side, um, but they chose you um, on, a, on a meritocracy and someone who could think in wartime in the first Gulf War. And in the picture that we're going to be using, there were two people in your tent behind you as you were planning on the table who you said became generals. Who, who were those two? And tell, tell us a bit about I don't know, a couple uh, of thoughts from the Gulf War. Well, uh, I'm trying to remember the picture now, but I, the one, one is Simon Mayle, who is on the left, I think, and the other is Mungo, General Mungo Melvin, who oh, yeah, is on Mungo the right. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the, I'd, in order to be able to move, I divided my headquarters into uh, four components. Uh, two tact uh, tactical, two rear, um, and Alpha Bravo for each of them. And in the forward ones, because it was going, they would be following up behind the um, uh, 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 the brigades in in battle. Um, I had uh, a, a, a an officer to command it as a sort of mini battle group, 
mm. and it had its own protection with it and so forth. Um, and Simon Mile was one of the, he was commanding um, Alpha. Um, I, I think we called it Maine, actually. Mm. Alpha Maine. And I had a man called Baxter commanded the Bravo, which otherwise I couldn't have remembered which was Alpha and which was Bravo. Um, and then the rear was was divided again. And yeah. so we always had a foot on the ground as we moved forward. You, you remind me of an interesting story. Um, somebody sends his compliments to you. His name is Simon Hutchinson. He became the signal officer in chief as a, yeah. as a brigadier, I think, or a colonel. And uh, he was uh, a signaler in charge of one of these uh, groups of armored vehicles. And he was trundling through the desert. The, it was nighttime. The vision was very bad. And they couldn't find your headquarters. They were looking for you. Uh, and then he saw this figure uh, out in the middle of the desert. And so he drove all his armored vehicles towards it, stopped, got out, toward, walked towards this figure who loomed out of the darkness with a shovel. <laughs> and, and he said, do you know where the headquarters is? He said, <laughs> to which this figure replied, can somebody not have a moment of peace in the desert? And this was you. <laughs> and he remembers it to this day. <laughs> Simon Hutchinson, who's the... Yes. Uh, Deputy Clark at the Goldsmiths Company. Yeah. And the of the Goldsmiths. Well, so he sends his regards. Yeah. Sends his regards. Bloody lucky I had some lavatory paper, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, the Gulf War and uh, amazing. I was, I was listening to the, the, the second one, Gulf War, and um, uh, the uh, Ameri American, sorry about the dogs in the background. The, okay. um, um, just which was the, the, the book? It was. Um, uh, call sign chaos, uh, Jim Mattis, the, the second yeah. Gulf War he was talking about, yeah. and you know his Marines and things like that. But if you were to pick a particular lesson of leadership, that, uh, there's so many that happened in war there in the Gulf War that, that could be passed on to other people, you know, a practical tip of something that you learned. Um, what would what would be one that you'd pick? There'd be so many, but what would be the one from the Gulf War for you? Um, of my own experience, mm, mm, yeah. Um, at the level I was commanding, um, as part of uh, a coalition um, that, that you know, politics starts to intervene in your purely military situation. Mm. Uh, so strategically, you've got to be absolutely clear that your military advice it, you don't you don't distort it to fit the political situation yeah. uh, the political situation must accommodate your advice um and and there is a a, a competition if you like between you and the political now that wasn't very evident in the end because we didn't have a friction mm. um but later in that decade, I'm in Bosnia and there's a hell of a lot of friction. So yeah. I, I, that was certainly a factor. Mm. Um, the, um, the, the next one, again, is organizational. Uh, you can lead and command as much as you like, but if you haven't got the organization right, then you won't uh, be in the right place at the right time with the information you need. Mm. Um, I had a very good chief of staff um, and a well worked up headquarters, uh, but we did change, as I said, we made it different in, because of what we were going to do. Mm. Um, and then lastly, the whole of the supply and maintenance um, and logistics of your force um, becomes ever more uh, central to your uh, thinking as you get f further up the tree, if you like, mm, yeah. and uh, you you have people, been, you know, you command who deal with the particular tactical issue. Yeah. I think well, that if we stay up at the sort of mm, strategic mm. levels. Yeah. And, and we've just got about five minutes left and, uh, and I'd love to there's so much more we could talk about, but I just want to keep it um, to just about 45 minutes. But um, Bosnia and D. Sacker, um, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe of, of, of NATO, uh, Bosnia, UN operations, and then NATO. Do you want to talk about perhaps 
couple of lessons you took away from that. And then we perhaps end with a couple of practical tips from you about leadership at any level that you might end us with. But Bosnia and then Dizeko, do you want to talk about some lessons well, you take from those? Yeah, I mean, two very different um, events, really. At Bosnia, I'm commanding a UN force uh, of 19 different nations. Wow. Um, uh, the, with a political component that you can imagine, with no political direction whatsoever. And all those people who complain about having political direction, I only say to them, wait till you haven't got any at all. Mm. Um, and it was, a, it was a difficult year. We, uh, with the lowest point being the massacres at Srebrenica mm. um, and uh, but that was the end of a you know a, 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 I'd had the authority to use air power taken away from me uh, we I'd had something like 350 people taken hostage and you know so on and so forth it, mm. uh, and uh, and then there was Srebrenica and another um, enclave no one ever hears about called Japa, which had also got uh, taken. We were able to get the people out of that one. Mm. Um, and then uh, there was, uh, 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 but I had been building up a, a force so I could. Um, uh, react when I could mm. and um, uh, the, the, the the conundrum was to be, to do this in full view uh, of everybody mm. uh, without anybody realizing its potential mm. and then to unleash the potential mm. um, and then we finished up with Dayton yeah um, and so, you know, that it, it, it the breaking the siege of mm. Sarajevo uh, was was a good feeling. Yeah, and even in my very small part, I was involved in the peacekeeping after Dayton Peace Accord in uh, Makonisgrad and Republika Srpska yeah. with you know a company of yeah. armoured warrior vehicles and. Yeah place about half the size of Wales, but thanks to what you'd done, the Serb, uh, Bosnian Serbs stayed in their barracks with their 20,000 troops yeah. and didn't come out. But yeah. when we did have air power call, well, they told me we did. <laughs> I don't know what would have happened. I had a few stories from that. <laughs> but, um, uh, and then finally, before we go into a couple of top top tips on, on leadership, what about your time as DSACER? Uh, um, that's a, a great role and you're dealing with all these NATO countries and multiple nations and different languages and things. What, yes. what did you take away from that? Well, the, the, ex the experience was, uh, I think, um, more akin to being a member of a sort of managing board of directors or something. There, mm -hmm. there were three uh, four-star generals in, in uh, the Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers Europe, and, and we're all there and everything is being warmed up for the, what became called the bombing in Kosovo and that mm. operation. And uh, an American Supreme Allied Commander, a Brit, me, the, the deputy, and then the chief of staff is a German. And we're looking at the problem, looking at how we were going to handle this. Um, and the politics of it was really complex. Um, and we, in effect, as a result of the politics, there were two operations, one embedded in another, and uh, which was required considerable management. Hmm. And we divided, uh, uh, divided the work up. Uh, the the Sakyar dealt with the actual Kosovo operation. Hmm. I dealt with all the operations going on around it. So I continued looking after Bosnia. And when the refugees all arrived in Albania and Macedonia, I also dealt with those mm. uh, 
uh, getting the aid in and so on. Mm. And the chief of staff dealt with NATO, uh, its allies and NATO headquarters. Yeah. And we divided the work up like that. And we meet, if not physically, on the telephone or a VCR uh, once a day. Mm. And, and that's how we managed it. And, I've, uh, and what little I've seen of business and commerce, it, it, you know, that, that model, as it were, is, it seems to me to be quite similar to yeah. what, what goes on in, in, in that field. Yeah, and, and I, I sort of wonder now with Donald Trump undermining NATO as an organization and Russia in the ascendancy and China playing into some, whether NATO could do what you did then now or whether it's been too, too neutered. I don't know whether you have a view. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, the, it, it's, it's a surprisingly effective machinery for concerting effort. Mm. Um, but, but it has always had um, the, the sort of thrust of the United States. Mm. And so the reason I'm hesitating to say yes or no is that I, I don't know whether that thrust has just been switched off or is it completely absent now? I, mm. I, we met, remains to be seen. Yeah, and whether with the change of president may, may be different, yeah. who knows. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And then finally, a bit before we wrap up, a couple of tips, top tips about being a leader and just practical things, that bit of wisdom that you found served you well and you'd pass it on to others who are listening. Um, apart from that fame has got no um, president, etc. cetera, um, I would... I try always try. I'm I'm talking, if you like, at more senior levels of leadership and and command. Um, you are doing this thing through people, mm. and the that they have to they represent you, and the you've got to be jolly careful uh, that you. Uh, bring all those subordinate leaders al along with you. And once you've done that, then all sorts of decisions can take place um, that you support and acknowledge. And you have given them control. Mm. You may be the commander, but they have control of the outcome. So you've got to keep then getting everyone in the same direction towards that outcome that you're trying to achieve. Very wise. That brings us to the close. Uh, General Sir Rupert Smith, thank you very much indeed. Um, and I, I wish you a, a safe travel back to the UK from Brussels when you do. <laughs> but we're very grateful for what you share. And I'm sure everybody will enjoy listening to it. So thank you very much. Thank you.